This device makes bug hunting way too easy, and it only costs 10 or so dollars. This is the CH341A. It is a spy flash reader, and you can use this device to get the firmware out of almost any piece of electronics that uses NOR flash. Now in this video, we're gonna go through what all that means, how this thing works, talk about the ethics of pulling the firmware off of devices, and I'll show you by hand how to pull the firmware off of a small little Soho router. Here, I have a Linksys E5400, which is a Wi-Fi router that you would use in your house. Now, if you're new here, hi, my name is Ed. This is Low Level Learning, a channel where I talk about software security, cybersecurity, a bunch of other crazy stuff. So if you like that or just wanna hang out, hit that sub button, I really appreciate it. Now, before we start, you may be curious why we're even doing this. Why do people do bug hunting in the first place? Well, I personally believe that it is the right of any person that owns a piece of electronics to know generally, A, the quality of the code in that electronic, but also B, what is going on inside of that software. Now, today we're focusing on this router here, the Linksys E5400, which is a very common, also very cheap piece of Wi-Fi equipment that people might use to spread Wi-Fi throughout their house. You plug this into the wire that comes off of your ISP, your internet service provider, and it will send Wi-Fi out throughout your house so people can use the internet wirelessly. Now, the problem with these devices is that they route all the traffic through the internet into your house. And as a result, if there are vulnerabilities in this device, a hacker that has control of some of the traffic that goes through your house could take advantage of a vulnerability to exploit the router. And as a result, getting code execution on a device in your house that sees all of your internet traffic. Also, a malicious actor could drive by your house, and if there's a vulnerability in the Wi-Fi processing of this thing, potentially exploit the router wirelessly from outside of your house and get control of the device. Not a great place to be. Now today, we're gonna use this device, the CH341A, to read the spy flash, or the serial peripheral interface flash, off of this router. I've taken the cover off of the router, and then we can see that there are three major components that we care about. First, the main CPU itself. Here on the main CPU, this is where all of the processing happens. All of the code that runs on the router that sends traffic from the internet into your house happens in this chip. Now, while the data is processed inside the CPU, the actual code that runs on the CPU comes from a piece of spy flash. The spy flash chip is what contains the code that runs on the CPU. Now, what we wanna do is extract the firmware from the spy flash chip and be able to take the code out to see exactly what the device is doing. Now, there are two ways we could do this. First, we could desolder the spy flash chip. We literally could use a soldering iron and pull the flash chip off of the board. The problem with this is we run the risk of potentially damaging the device. I know personally my soldering skills aren't super good, so if I desolder the device and wasn't able to put the solder back onto the device, there's a potential that I could break it, and if I only have one of them or don't wanna buy multiple, this could cause an issue. This is where the CH341 comes in. The CH341 allows us to, without desoldering the chip, read the memory off of the flash chip. It does this by using the SPI protocol, the Serial Peripheral Interface Protocol, to send the flash chip the right series of opcodes to tell the SPI flash chip to emit the firmware. This is actually exactly what the CPU does when it turns on. It sends the opcodes to the SPI flash chip and the SPI flash chip as a result emits the firmware. What we're able to do is clip this device onto the SPI flash chip and we will get the firmware. Also, bug hunting in things like IoT devices and Soho routers is a pretty common place to find really interesting vulnerabilities because a lot of embedded software manufacturers don't keep their code up to date. There was a whole line of routers, for example, that used a version of OpenSSL that was known for a long time to have vulnerabilities, but until someone took the firmware apart and saw this old version of OpenSSL, no one really knew that there was a problem. The CH341 isn't just for pulling firmware off of devices. If the spy flash chip that you're looking at on your device allows for writing, which most of them do, you can use this device to flash a new piece of firmware onto that spy flash chip. Whether or not that's going to work is going to be a function of how the bootloader works and if there's an internal flash on the chip that reads a spy flash chip and expects a certain format, but a lot of the devices, including this Linksys router we're working on, allow us to flash new firmware onto the device. The reason people do this is sometimes people just outright don't trust the software that is on these routers. And that's actually a fair assessment to make. Because the software that these manufacturers produce is closed source, sometimes it feels more secure to put an open source alternative on the device. We can use this device here to flash a new firmware onto this router like OpenWRT or DDWRT. And now we know exactly what the code is doing on the device, provided we've read the code. Read the code.
Today's video is sponsored by me. My website, Low Level Academy, is a really cool place where you can learn about the fundamentals of computing. I personally believe that if you don't know how computers work at a basic level, you really aren't gonna be a good programmer in any other language. So you can take my course right now on C programming, on network code in C, on threading in C, and also ARM assembly. If you wanna check it out before you buy, I have a free lesson right now that is about 12 minutes long on the ARM instruction set and how to do load operations. You can't be a good programmer unless you know how computers work at a fundamental level. And where do you learn that? At Low Level Academy. Back to the CH341. The way the CH341 works is you plug the device into a clip. We're able to use that clip to wrap around the exposed pins on the SPY flash chip. By putting the clip on the chip and putting it into this device, we can plug this device into our computer and drive it via a program like FlashROM. FlashROM instructs the device to send certain SPY flash commands to our SPY flash chip and from the chip comes out the firmware. Now, note the device is able to support 8-pin spy flash and 16-pin spy flash. You'll need different clips for that, but luckily the device comes with both. All right, so now that we have our chip clipped onto our board, we can do something simple like sudo apt install to get the program that's actually going to run and communicate with the CH341 to pull the flash off the device. The program today is gonna to be flash ROM. You can either get it off of apt or you can go and build it from source. The version on apt is perfectly fine for this use case. Now to run flash ROM is really simple. We're gonna do tech capital V for verbose output to see exactly what it's doing. We're gonna say read the flash out to blob.bin. We're gonna use this programmer here, which is a programmer we have plugged into our computers. If we do this, what it's gonna do right now is actually probe the spy flash chip for all of the potential IDs that it can have. And after it enumerates all the IDs that spy flash chip can have, we're eventually gonna see that it found the Windbond flash chip that is on the device, the W25Q128. This chip has 16 megabytes of spy flash, which is gonna pull out at a fairly slow spy baud rate. So this process will take around 15 minutes to do. Now, when it gets done doing this, we're gonna have this file called blob.bin. If we run file on blob.bin, we'll see that it just says that it's data, which means that the first couple bytes of this blob are not recognizable as a known file header. And that's because a lot of this information is just metadata that the manufacturer put in there to hold information about what the file is. Now, based on this, it does not appear there's a lot of structure to this file, these could just be raw opcodes for the bootloader, for example, that runs when the board turns on. To get an idea of what's in here, we can do something like strings on blob.bin, pump it into less. We see there are some, you know, non-ASCII printables here, some potentially opcodes we said before, but eventually we'll go down here and we'll get to some new interesting strings. We'll say uBoot and then HTTP responses. So we're seeing already, we're getting an idea of what is in this file. We have uBoot, which is a known bootloader for embedded devices that takes the main operating system out of memory and puts it into the CPU. The bootloader is always what runs first. Also, we have some web pages here. I'm assuming that uBoot is probably gonna host an HTTP server that we can use to upload our own firmware. That's pretty cool. Now, the CH341 isn't just for reading Flash. We actually can write to the Flash too, provided that the Flash chip is not write protected and allows us to write multiple cycles to multiple Flash sectors. What we can do is we can go into the Flash and look for the string uBoot and change that to the string you boo. And then if we take this and we write it, we're able to use the same command. And instead of reading the flash chip, it's going to write it. Now, first of all, before you do this, please have a copy of the flash before you try to overwrite the flash. If you corrupt the file system or make it so that the flash chip isn't in the same order as before, you may end up bricking your device. You don't want to have that. So we can now write our blob.bin. It's going to do the same thing here. It's going to probe the flash chip to figure out what flash chip we're talking about. And then ultimately, because I hit enter, I messed up the size of the image. Let's go back and fix that real quick. Again, it's very important to be very specific here when we're doing this. So let's go ahead and edit edit our file, if I look for you boob. We'll just change it to you boo, because it apparently is mad that I made the file too big. Okay, same thing. So what it's actually gonna do here is what is called a differential read. It's gonna read all the flash out and then figure out what is supposed to be there and then only write the parts that are different. Now we could manually go through and dissect blob.bin and find all the interesting files ourselves, but there's actually a program that does that for us. It's called binwalk. 
Now we're gonna use bin walk in tack M mode, which is a fancy Russian word that means recursively. It's going to open all the files until it can't open any more files. And the E flag is going to say to extract. We're gonna run that on blob.bin. What's gonna happen here is it finds a couple interesting things. First, that U boot stream we called up before, some HTML documents that we also saw before. But the most important part here is a U image header. Now the U image header is gonna be what contains the Linux OS, and it actually tells us what the architecture of the CPU is as well. It's gonna be a MIPS CPU. Now, if we dive deep into the files that Binwalk extracts for us down this path here, we get a root file system. This is actually the code that runs on the router that we bought, and now we have access to all the code. We can go into these binaries one by one and start our bug hunting process. And if we find a bug in these binaries, those are the ones that are on the router, so it's on that router too. Now, let's talk ethics. Is it unethical or illegal to do what we're doing? I think the answer is no, but I'm not a lawyer. The answer is actually probably, it depends on what country you're in. In the US, it is not illegal to do this where we're extracting the firmware of a device. Now, if we were intending on trying to reveal a trade secret for us to exploit from a corporate standpoint and use that trade secret to make money, then it gets a little hairy. But actually a recent court case against a security researcher in Apple determined that if we are doing reverse engineering for the sake of security research, where we are trying to make ourselves more secure or find bugs and software, it is actually totally legal to do this. Now that being said, from an ethical standpoint, if you find a bug in a piece of software, maybe don't go around and throw it in the wild. Maybe report to the vendor, and if they have a bug bounty program, you might get yourself some quick cash. Now that being said, if you're new to this world, I highly recommend go out and find a CVE that already exists, maybe a buffer overflow and an IP camera. Go buy the IP camera and see if you can extract the firmware with this device and exploit the bug yourself. This is kind of a fun way of figuring out how to get into bug finding by looking for bugs that already exist. It takes the guesswork out of whether or not there is or is not a bug in a thing. The CH341A, a cool tool that makes bug hunting almost too easy. Now for the next video, go watch this one where I talk about something that's even cooler than this.